Welcome to the HU Movemakers Podcast, where we highlight folks that are blazing the trail and making moves in Howard culture. Welcome to the HU Movemaker Podcast, where we highlight Howard folks that are making moves in the world. And today we got a, a very special guest, a woman who came into Howard with me. I wasn't sure if she remembered me, though, but she does. So that's that's cool. But Queens, New York. Accounting, get the money. <laughs> Queens, you, you might have noticed her from those epic fashion shows uh, at, at Homecoming. Or if you was a nerd, you probably saw her in Beta Alpha Psi Accounting Honor Fraternity. You saw her dressed up in the school of B. Uh, today, she's a mom of three, happily married, first generation graduate, uh, which I think is awesome. Professional encourager so we got a lot to talk about um you know a lot a lot of the guests that we have on the show are i bring on because of the work that they've done after college you know and i think that which, which is awesome but so but our, our guest today candace hudson i want to talk to her because i mean you know one of the things in your bio that you put you said um you were chosen to break dysfunctional generational cycles and I think that kind of started I think it started you know back in 99 98 you know because it wasn't an easy role for you but I'll, I'll let you tell it so when you put that in your bio what what does that mean so for me um I have this thing too that I call myself the bloodline breaker and that's because I've always been the first to do something in my family, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, my mom and dad had three girls. I was the first one to, you know, I'm, I I'm, wasn't normal. I didn't have like a, I would have like a lemonade stand. I always had a business every summer. You know what I mean? Like I'm the youngest one. I was very uh, inquisitive. So I would seek out things for me to do. And, you know, my mom would let me do a lot of different programs. Some things that maybe my sister's, did some things but my dad always told me i was a little different and even when i wanted to go to howard i wanted to go to howard since the sixth grade right there was no college graduates in my house i had a cousin that went to college and she lived in maryland but where i was in south jamaica queens it wasn't i, I didn't see it a lot and even in my bio i mentioned me you know watching a different world and um how i even found out about howard is that my sister actually just went to homecoming and I would be up under my older sister and her her friends were just talking about what happened. And I was like, oh, that sounds fly. Y'all have fun. Mind you, she's like eight years older than me, but I was always the little girl in the room. And she bought me back a shirt. And the shirt had all the HBCUs on it. And I would tell everybody, well, I'm going to go to Howard. And it was kind of like also me mimicking my sister, but there was no one else, none of my friends or anybody in the neighborhood talking about college. And it wasn't something that was like, oh, that's cute. Candace is talking about college. Like I knew about the school. I'm in sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. I knew about the school. And I was the first one in my family to even really pursue college like that. And I was always the one to do something first. And I feel like when you are the one that is doing something first, there's something that there's like a calling on your life. And if you are the first, then you know that you're going to endure something. And like mm. you said, that happened in 99 because it was like a miracle because I grew up, you know, in the hood, pretty poor. We didn't have money to send me to college. I went to Howard for a weekend on a college tour. My church like took up a collection to send me there and back. You know wow. what I mean? Yeah. Like it was a big thing for me. Um, and my bishop at the time where I was going to church, he was always like, he was a college grad. He, he was like Bill Cosby's cousin. He was on the radio. He was pretty popular, but he always encouraged the youth. And for me, he he always kind of, you know, encouraged me in front of the congregation. And it did make me feel good. Um, and he did that for all of us. So he was very, very encouraging. Once he found out that that was my dream and I wanted to do it and I was doing really well in school, he kept pushing me. And but I noticed as soon as I got to school, um, you know, all hell broke loose. <laughs> so you know how do I mean? you you know how do you have these desires to, to do something when there's no real blueprint for you to kind of achieve these i know you 
you know, school is structured for the most part, but it's hard to want to do something when your parents haven't done it and, you know, your family hasn't done it. Where did that come from? And that's so funny. And I think that's what, you know, my mom and dad kind of saw in me is that I literally would have a desire for something. And like you said, there was no blueprint, right? So um, I would talk to my bishop. He was a college graduate. He would talk to me about some things when I was interested. But once my sister went to Howard and I loved watching A Different World and they would kind of say, this is how it is at Howard. I was like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> but I, I, was the, I was the type of kid that, I really envisioned myself there. Like, wow. oh, you know, I love step and stuff. And I saw sororities and I just really began to, and that's, and that might be my creative, my creative side of me. I was like, I thought Hillman was based off Howard. Yeah. And that's just how it went for me. And it was literally like that show inspired me so much. And I believed it so much that I believed that I could get there, even though there was no visible. There was no signs. There was no money. <laughs> there was nothing that, that could tell me that I would be there, but you couldn't tell me different. Not to jump around, but I, I would imagine your mom working like this and she see, you know, you're you're a standout student, you know, pretty, you're killing it, you know, you from Queens. The, the bishop got you in front, like, yo, this is the one. <laughs> this is the one, <laughs> you know, and then you go to Howard, you, you get pregnant. Mm. I was so embarrassed because and this is this is freshman year. Yeah, cuz yeah, it's between yeah, cuz when I came back sophomore year, I'm already pregnant, right? So, Ooh, between the nice. end of freshman year and the summertime, something happened, right? And um I grew up, you know, even with everyone encouraging me, it was also hard because like I said, when you're the first one to do something, you also feel like you have like this you're carrying, you know, like the weight of it. Right. So I had this good girl thing going on, identity. Right. And that's something that I actually had to, you know, break out of. And, and, and why I do what I do now is because I felt like I took on the identity that everyone was giving me. Like she's like you said, they were like, she's the one. She's the one that's going to make it. She's the one that's going to do it. But that also came with a lot of pressure. So when I got pregnant, I hid it from my parents for seven months. Damn. Literally, like, Damn. So we gonna, we gonna, we gonna pause. We're going to pause right there. All right. So you hit it for seven months. All right. So rewind a little bit. So you get to Howard. We get to Howard. 99. What was that feeling like when you finally made it? it I mean, when my whole, like, my mom and my aunt and my dad drove me down. And to see the look on my parents' face, their faces, was insane. Like, my mom is a, you know, God rest her soul, she's no longer here, but she was a crybaby. Like, and, oh, really? yeah, she, she, she was in her glory, right? Because she saw wow. it happen. And then on top of that, like, I mean, that weekend she was also working, though, like, you know, one of my best friends, Cleona, was my roommate. They messed up her room. They had put her in Meridian. She was supposed to be in the choir with me. My mom went and fixed it. Like, oh, no, we got to we gotta fix this. You know, like, she was on her business. Like, she was out there working. She stayed the weekend. She made sure she went to financial aid. Like, oh, let me find somebody um, you could talk to. So here's the thing about my mom. She might have only had a high school education, but she was so smart. She literally, like, whatever she knew to do, common sense wise, that's what she would teach me. So she knew we didn't really have money. Even then I had to settle my bills since I got to campus. She would go to financial aid and she went to each wow. person. This is my mother. She said, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. When somebody said, hallelujah, she said, and that's the one you go speak to, right? Like the person that responded <laughs> back to her. And that woman wound up being my, my go-to person because she fixed wow. my, my bill. But that's what I'm saying. My mother was there and she like worked the weekend and like she did everything. She made sure she went around the campus. My dad bought all the paraphernalia he could buy. I know you he know did. What I mean? So they were like elated. Welcome to the Go Fish Village podcast. As a Chinese proverb says, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. At Go Fish, our goal is to teach individuals just like you 
how to build wealth through real estate. Now you, I, I, I specifically remember um, the New York crew, and ah. I don't know, if, <laughs> I don't know if y'all knew that y'all had that title, but we that did. was a title that all the outsiders like myself, you know, because y'all was always dressed to the to the nines. I didn't know what red bottoms was till like I got married and my wife was like, "Yeah, I need them." <laughs> you know, I mean, y'all y'all was on it, you know, from from jump. And in New York, y'all was aggressive, you know, Robbio. Y'all was loud, yes. you know what I'm saying? Y'all y'all was the way y'all move was just different. You know what I mean? Y'all stood out. Um well when how many people when you got to Howard were you did you have friends already? So I came, when I came to Howard, I had two friends. I had uh -huh. Cleona. Me and Cleona went to high school together and she was my okay. roommate. And also Lindsay. Lindsay was only there for two years, um, but Lindsay went to the school across the street from me. Um, our high schools were directly across the street from each other. And Lindsay was- And Lindsay, she, she does like insurance now, yes. right too, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. She okay, does like it. insurance. Yeah. So yeah. I knew them. But Cleona came on the orientation weekend. I actually didn't come. And Cleona met, um, I think she met Rob and Cece that orientation <laughs> weekend, right? So yeah, I when I get Cece. there, yeah, so when I get there, we now have Lindsay, Cece, Rob, we know Rob, right? And I got- How'd y'all know Rob? How'd y'all know Rob? No, but she met him during orientation weekend. That's and- great. You know, I thought y'all just came together. Like y'all was just all oh, just deep and and- clicked up i was like damn who who is this group <laughs> and, and and funny because i remember the first thing everyone said was like y'all won't be friends till senior year and i'm like nah we're still friends like tight yeah. tight tight i already text them like guess what i'm gonna be on the podcast <laughs> <laughs> that's dope that's dope man yeah i mean i obviously knew rob because he was uh my year but that's that's dope man so when you what was your first impression i remember you know, long lines, <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I remember it being hot, but I just, I remember being excited. I mean, were you, when you got to campus, I know you had always wanted to come and like, did you have something in your mind? Like, yo, I'm going to do this. Like, were you thinking about career? Were you thinking about joining organizations? What was your mindset when you, when parent, when your parents are gone? So, so funny. My son even asked me this before. He was like, Ma, did, were you like, um, cause he's looking at me now. He doesn't know me, you know, as obviously as a teenager, he was like, you seem like you would have been like into it, like on some, you know, black power. I'm here at this black school. I said, the minute I got there, I was like, thank God I'm free. I'm out the hood. I was like, I didn't have, I mean, I really didn't even have the full focus of what I wanted to do yet. Like I knew I was going to be in accounting, but I felt free. Right. Mm -hmm. And not that my neighborhood wasn't like horrible. Like it wasn't, it was, you know, it had its things, but sometimes you had this, I had this feeling, you know, even beforehand that I didn't think I was going to get to go, even though I knew that was my passion and desire, I kept seeing hindrances. So when I got there, it felt like a relief. And then I was like, I just started enjoying myself and then I, I took it in. But when my parents left, it was like, I did it. So as a, as somebody that's first generation, um, I had somebody else on the show. I don't know if you know Halima, Halima Nash. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she, she, she brought up, uh, imposter syndrome. Mm. Is, was, was that something that you fell victim to or maybe yes. t talk about that for a second? I sure did because, um, so funny. Cause once classes started, you noticed that I was, you know, I'm pretty smart in high school. You get to college, everybody's smart, right? Like, <laughs> it's not just me anymore. Everybody, everybody's smart. smart. You no, know, everybody's smart. Everybody pretty. <laughs> Every, <laughs> everybody was. was like, everybody was president as well. You know, everybody was all of these amazing things. I was like, they're mad. Like I did stuff, but I, I didn't. I hadn't done what some of these other freshmen had did. You know what yeah. I mean? So you do get that feeling of imposter syndrome, as if I'm not worthy. Or I don't belong here. You know what I mean? Um, and I got that a little bit. Even when I started taking exams and stuff started getting a little hard, I was like, oh gosh, like, mm. am I as smart as I thought I was, right? Do I really deserve to be here? And my mom, you know, back then she's like sending me letters. She would, you know, 
as soon as I got there, I already was getting letters in the mail. And wow. my church was like, they sent me like the church bulletin. <laughs> and I was getting, she was encouraging me like, I want you to know I'm proud of you. Do your best. Because I think she also knew that about me too. But I think imposter syndrome hits you hard because when I mean, you're coming from some place where you felt like, okay, like I said, I had that whole identity thing going on. I felt pretty much like the best, right? At what yeah. I did and what I was doing. And then you come somewhere and it's mad other people like that, right? Yeah. So you kind of get a little frightened by it. Damn, man. So you get to Howard, man. I mean, adjustment, I would say was, you know, you, you made a good adjustment, but, you know, it takes a dark turn, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, devastation hit your family, you know, like you mentioned. Um, your home back in Queens uh, burnt down, right? Mm -hmm. what, at, what part, at what point of your freshman uh, year is this when that happens? I didn't even get to settle in yet. I was there for two weeks before my house caught on fire. Whoa. And, it, and, and now here's when the imposter syndrome hit hard because I felt like that was a sign telling me I didn't deserve to be there. Mm. Right? And then you, first you're scared. My cousin, I had a cousin that lived in Maryland nearby. She calls me. And here's the thing, when, we, when they brought me down, we literally came down to Howard in my, my aunt's car because we didn't have a car. And I had suitcases. I had garbage bags. Like, we couldn't even bring all my stuff. So, literally, my house caught on fire on a Wednesday. And they were my family was scheduled to come that very Saturday with the rest of my things. So, I didn't even have all my stuff. Everyone, everything was gone in the house. Like, only thing that came out was whatever they had on their bodies. And my mother grabbed her pocketbook. Right? And it all went out the window. And to hear that and just hear the story, because at the same time, it's, you know, my mom, my dad, my two sisters, and my niece, um, the first grandchild, my niece is also there. And I cried immediately because the thought of saying, I chose to be here, but what if, God forbid, I had lost my whole family and I would have been all alone, right? Yeah. And then the imposter syndrome hit because it's like, oh, if I could barely afford to be here, I, I can't stay. Like, how could I stay here? We have nowhere to live. We were already trying to make ends meet. How selfish of me to want to sit here in this school that's going to cost me how many thousands of dollars and my family don't even have any clothes to change into? It was like the most devastating thing to hit. And I was only there for two weeks before it happened. So did this home, did your parents own the home? No. It was a like a three family house. So we wow. were in the uh, first floor apartment of the house. That's how a lot of the houses were in, in Queens and stuff. And that's how, you know, people would have four family houses, three family houses, two family, and then rent them out. So that, that goes back to, I guess, that step one of being chosen to break those, gen those, uh, those dysfunctional cycles. So, I mean, how are you getting through this? I mean, you got this new set of friends, you're in this new environment. You know, you in a competitive space. You know what the school of business was. I mean, mm -hmm. you, I can, I hear Mr. Gray right now. You know, don't forget your groceries. You know, never forget that. Uh, oh, I have man. so many stories of Mr. Gray during this time. He blessed me. Let's talk about that because I feel like, man, you know, I, I, I grew up with my dad like in and out of my life, and. And I and, and not to say any other man that I grew up, but when when I met Mr. Gray, like everything about that man was just like, like mm. you know what I'm saying? Like it was like, yo, who Nobody like touch Mr. Gray? Right, like like it was like Mr. Gray could be like, yo, go jump out that window. <laughs> I'll be like, I <laughs> bet. <laughs> like he used to just be putting you on the game, just like like his smile, his look. It was just like, yo, this is. I felt like he was just like everything like a black man should aspire to be, you know, and, you know, but yeah, go tell me about your Mr. Gray story. Okay. So I was working in the school of B. I had work study sophomore year before anyone knew I was pregnant and I was and, working in CPD. And, and Mr. Gray is, what, what, what's his title? So people can, can know. 
Like what? Oh gosh, what's, what's Mr. Gray? Or not his title, but his responsibility was he basically like helped freshmen. Oh yeah, or well, Center for you know, Professional Development, right? Yes, yeah. he ran the Center for, Pro for Professional Development, which means he was helping us get our resumes. He was um, managing the companies when they were coming in, so you can interview. He was setting up all those classes. We had to take like golf etiquette, you know, uh, your dinner etiquette, all those things that he knew that well howard knew that we would need to compete in corporate mm -hmm. america right so yeah. we are our school of business we're the black with the black harvard school of business you know what i mean so you know they pressed that into us so i was working in cpd and once everybody when it became out that i was pregnant all that time because they didn't know either and one day i come into work and they call me into mr gray's office and it's mr gray miss black Miss Hampton and another uh, two students that worked there, and they threw me a baby shower. That was my first baby shower. Really, Mr. Gray? Yes, they threw me a baby wow. shower in Mr. Gray's office. I mean, he. I used to talk to him about how I was feeling, and he would sit me down in his office all the time to tell me, "Candace, you deserve to be here. Candace, you're going to be a great mother." Like he. Uh, he would see me wandering the building and he would say, come in and do this class with me. Like I'm not working. And this is when I was pregnant and I was to linger around and I would stay around and help him with stuff. But he was always like, I mean, Mr. Gray encouraged me so much because I think he knew what I was up against and he didn't want me to quit. Damn, man, Mr. <laughs> Gray, man, <laughs> Mr. Gray. I mean, that that's, that's the difference to me between that HBCU experience exactly. and what you may get at another school is it, is folks like Mr. Gray, man. You know, that's that's so that's so real. So, so the house burns down, and I read, you know, that during the summertime, I mean, you're basically staying in shelters. Yeah, we Damn. were in the Bronx in a shelter, and you know, you could live in the hood. But somebody else's hood is 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 different. In the Bronx where we were, I don't even remember the exact area, but it was it was worse than where I grew up. And my mom was like, you know, I would take my niece to the store. And this was the kind of area I was like at night, I was like, there was too much going on. I didn't even want to be outside. Like I hated it. Right. So you're reminded that the fact that I'm in this shelter, I we don't have a home. It's crazy over here. My mom and them are getting stuck in elevators. She don't want me outside because it looked like people might be following me, you know, because I'm a young girl. And it was it was like the worst. <laughs> I, I, I love being with my family. I think we made the best of it. But that even, and thank God we were only in the shelter a short amount of time. We were only in the shelter about, I, I'm going to say about seven months before we actually, this, at this point, we, we um, purchased our first home. My parents yeah. purchased it purchase their first home but mind you the, the time that they are purchasing their first home i'm in college i mean what was that like for you having to navigate in all these different worlds of like howard and almost like homelessness and at the same time you trying to excel you know what i mean yeah i think you know i mean thank god i had a lot of my clothes and sneakers and things with me right uh so even after the house burnt down on that Wednesday, my family still came to Howard that Saturday. Like they still found a way to get to me. And they were supposed to bring like my, I had a new refrigerator, a computer, all that stuff got burnt up. So even though my house burnt down on Wednesday, this is how my family was. They found a way, they got down there Saturday. I had an aunt, two aunts in Maryland. One aunt bought me um, her computer off her desk and gave it to me. Uh, Cleona's parents, they came down with my parents and they gave me a new refrigerator. So now me and Clee have like two. And even that weekend, I gave my sisters, they couldn't fit my clothes, but they could fit my shoes. So I sent them back with like a pair of sneakers each uh, from what I had in a pair of shoes and anything that I had that was, you know, at that time, some of my stuff was a little big, some was fitted. Um, I sent back with my sisters, but I think I felt it the most is when Although I had clothes at school so I could still dress up and be who I was, when everybody wanted to do simple things like, let's go to the mall, let's go to the movies, let's order, you know, some wings, let's go to China Wonder, stuff like that. I didn't have any money. So were your friends, were they understanding or was it, you know, yeah. what, what was what was that? So 
I have, I, I, I remember speaking even last, uh, about two summers ago. And when I give this testimony of, of my college experience, I always speak about them. And I say, God really knew, like, here's the thing, like, you don't know that you're the generational curse breaker, right? Like you don't know that, but God already has things set in place because he gave me those specific people who 20 years later are still my closest friends and they had to be the most respectful of my situation. They were kind. Like nobody knew if I was wearing Kindle shoes or not. Right, because I didn't have a pair of shoes to wear out, and we wear the same size. And she's like, "Yeah, just put these on, right?" Or Cleona, knowing I probably didn't have the cash, she's not going to say anything. But when they order food, she goes, "What you want? What do you need? What do you want?" Right? To the point when I had my son, and I debated with the idea of not even like, should I keep him? What do I do? You know, you go through all those motions. I'm only a, a young kid, right? I'm still a teenager. My friends had that talk with me but the minute i decided to have him and had him nobody knew this but those same group of girls and rob when i didn't have a babysitter for him and i couldn't find one do you know that they scheduled their classes and um around my classes so they could take turns watching my son wow. and nobody knew they did that they mm. literally had a schedule going like candace has class this time and i was still i was um trying to do work study and they like i knew who had my son at what time when i was in class and they did that on their own man that's crazy <laughs> <laughs> that's heavy right there that's heavy stuff right there so you get pregnant is this the summer going into sophomore year yeah i think that i think it was that summer <laughs> so you get pregnant the summer going into sophomore year you get back to campus when you find out you're pregnant, you know, I mean, who, who's the first person you tell? I told my two cousins that are like my best friends. Um, I told them first and they kept my secret. Um, I told them and then besides them, I told, you know, the crew at Howard. No one really knew. My si I didn't even tell my sisters because I was like, the minute I tell them, they're going to rat me out. You know what I mean? Because they're older than me. And um, I don't, I was in shock for so long. Like I, I felt like for like a good month, I didn't even deal with it. Like I knew I was pregnant, but I was just like, I don't even want to deal with this. I don't want to have to face anybody. So your um, child's father, are, are you all still together? No. Okay. So, I mean, was there like, Tell me about the fears. Like, what what are like the initial fears that comes into your mind when you're at that point? Because I remember I had my first child. I think I was thirty. Was my my son six? I was thirty two. I remember I was like I was like, I'm not ready to be a dad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm I'm thirty two with it. A homeowner. You know, been on the job ten years. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. what 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 goes through? What are some of the fears that it go through your mind at that point? The first thing I thought, just like when the house caught on fire, I'm gonna have to drop out of school. Because at that time, I didn't, I didn't see anyone on campus. And, and come to find out, there were tons of people on campus that had kids, and I didn't know. But um, I, I, I didn't see it. I was thinking I'm gonna have to drop out of school. I'm like, is this not the worst time? And we just moved into this house. We're just coming out of the shelter, and then I get pregnant. It, it felt like a, a whole new burden. I don't have a job, you know what I mean? And I was just like, I'm gonna have to drop out of school, that's number one. Number two, I was still dealing with that identity thing and I'm like, oh gosh, Candace done fell from her good graces, you know what I mean? Like, I'm never, not me, you know? It can never have been me having the opportunity to be the first one to go to college in your family and you be that irresponsible to do something like that. So I had a, a big fear of having to drop out of school the fear of becoming a mom. Like I had my niece and I was like, she's a, a, a whole job. And my sister lived at home with us, with my niece. So I saw what it was taking care of her and helping out my sister. And I couldn't understand. I was like, how am I gonna do that? 
even if I have to leave out of school, like I knew at the time my son's father, like we were together, but we weren't together. Like it was, you know, I knew there was a, that situation was not a good situation. And I, all I could think too was like, oh God, I'm going to be stuck to him for forever. You know, like I, I was trying to get away from that situation and, and I was still in it at the same time. So I just like was scared. I just had a fear of, I don't know how I'm going to do what's next. I'm going to fall flat on my face. What are some of the emotions that led you to move forward with, with, with having a child? You know what? I mean, I think I stalled in telling my family because I didn't want anyone to try to talk me out of it. At some point I knew I was like, you know, even, and at the time my son's father, you know, we, we were having a discussion about it, you know, and he had his ideas about it. I didn't fully agree. He would be on board with it. Then he'd be like, Oh, you know, he, you would get fearful. So he's like, maybe we shouldn't keep the baby or, and stuff like that. And then after a while, I just felt like, I just felt this desire in me. And I was like, I'm going to keep them. And I told so, my friends first. And I was like, I'm going to keep the baby. I just don't know how to tell my family yet. No, but when you guys are making this decision at, at that young of an age, are you, are you guys still together? Are you guys like, yo, we're not going to be together anyway. Why keep it? Or is it like, you know, like we what? Still, yeah, no, we were still dating. We were still dating. Okay. Um, but here's the thing, like, I knew it wasn't a good relationship, but I was still with him. One of those, you know, dumb teenager things, right? Like I, and once I honestly, once I had my son, it was kind of like those things that woke me up too. Um, when we really did decide not to be together, but I knew I wanted to keep him. And, and I think I stalled also in telling my family because I didn't want anybody to try. Not that they, I don't know if they would have not, you know, what they would have said or not, but I didn't want anyone to talk me out of it. So once they did find out, I was too far along, right? So it is what it is. We all got to stick with it. I didn't know how any of this was going to turn out, mind you, even when I was made the decision to keep him. But even going back to school, so my mom found out during Christmas break of sophomore year. And okay. I told her, I, and this is the plan I did have. I, I had made a plan to say, I was actually, I wanted to tell her Christmas break because I knew that I was getting so big. I'm a small girl. I'm still small. Like I was in school, not I'm bigger, but I was really small in school and I was wearing bigger clothes. So it was easy to hide because my, I wasn't really big, but I knew that I couldn't hide it any longer. So even when my sister found out, I was already wanted to tell my mom. So mm -hmm. when she found out, I already had a plan. I said, now that she knew her and my dad knew, I said, I'm not going to go back to school for spring semester. I'm going to take a year off or I'm going to take the semester and the summer so I can have him and then I'll go back. And then my mom told me, no, she said, you're going to get yourself back on the bus. Mm. You're going to go back to campus. And, Cause I didn't want to go back really big either. I was, because at the time y'all don't know either. Right? right. I was, I kept it pretty quiet from everyone. She was like, no, you're going to go back. And she said, and you go figure it out. You're not taking any time off. And that was a first for my mom because she usually agreed with things that I said, like all the time, like y'all risking it all to send me to school. Yeah. And, and this is the first time, like I came up with a whole idea and she didn't go with it. And I said, okay, so I go back to school. And when I go back to school, I go to each professor and I tell them the situation I'm going to, I'm due in February. What can I do? to finish out the semester. So I literally made an agreement with each of my professors. Um, let Ms. Gray, I, Dr. Gray knew, Ms. Black knew. I went to Ms. Hampton to get advice. I went to the head of the departments for the classes that I had. Um, and they literally said that you could go home and do work remotely. You just couldn't get, although like even some of my classes, I was getting an A. I think one or two professors said you can't get an A because literally you're not physically here for attendance wise. And the only real requirement I had that was, you know, a little inconvenient was that for, remember in accounting principles, we took the test in the auditorium. Yeah, I hated accounting. Hated it. My major, but for <laughs> the accounting test, I literally, when I was home on maternity leave, I had to get back on the bus and come in for the day to take the test and go back. They told me I could not miss that test. I had to sit physically for it. So here I am nine months coming back when I was supposed to, when I, once I did leave in February, my son was born February 20th. I think the, 
maybe the first or second week of February, I left school to come home to have him because I wanted to come home as close to my due date as possible. But I went back before I gave birth to take the accounting principal test and I did all my work from home. Wow. So you, you bounced back. <laughs> oh, I bounced back. So, so, so you Real bounced good. back. Tell Real me about good. the tell me about the bounce back. So I mean, uh, you know, I was already thin and mm -hmm. I have a fast metabolism. So the bounce back was actually really easy. And I remember when I gave birth to him, I remember the nurses and stuff would be looking and they're looking at my stomach and it says it doesn't look like you gave birth while I was in the hospital and I actually had a C-section. But when I got back to school, wow. like it didn't, I, I looked the same. I had like a couple of extra pounds, but I mean, I bounced back real quick. In the minute they said it was okay because I had a C-section, the minute they said I was healed, I was right back auditioning to get on a runway because when I was pregnant, that's the one thing I missed the most was walking in a show. Hmm. Damn. That's crazy. What was it like to be, because these are notorious fashion shows. I remember being at Howard. I remember seeing LeBron at a fashion show. I remember seeing Serena at a fashion show. I worked at Crampton, so that was like my mm. little hustle. So, I mean, those fashion shows was crazy. I remember, um, I remember, uh, I forgot who was over the uh, fashion show. I don't know if it was Alicia. I, I, I don't know who it was over the fashion show one year, and they asked, they was like, yeah, we need help uh, greasing the models. I was like, oh, <laughs> I was like, that's it. I was like, that's the thing, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but anyway, needless to say, like, yeah, those fashion shows were epic. You know, Lance, you know, being the fashion shows. Um, mm -hmm. what what was that rush like to mm -hmm. kind of be down and having a real real adult responsibilities, and now you, you know, you back, you know? It was once I bought him on campus, and and again, this is gonna just you know, solidify what we've been saying about the culture at our school. So once I brought him back on campus, Lance, Dud, Esco, like when we're in a show, they're like chasing my son around or they're holding him for me when it's my turn to walk, if I had to bring him with me. Mm. You know what I mean? Like you could see, you could see Lance chasing him, you know, around trying to catch him at the time when he started walking you know what I mean? And it's my turn to walk. And they, are, they would, you know, the guys mostly would watch him as I'm walking besides him, you know, if he's sitting in his stroller, the girls are there. So they may, again, nobody like made me feel awkward. They were just like, oh, you got the baby with you? Okay. I got him. It's your turn. I got him. I'll watch him. You know what I mean? So it made it fun to be back. I was glad that, again, it wasn't no awkwardness or anything like that. And I was glad that I was still getting to do that because amongst everything else, I had a responsibility of having a son. I couldn't go out like everybody else. I couldn't do what everybody else was doing. God, let me have my fashion shows. <laughs> let yeah. me have my shows because it's what I enjoy to do. Man, do, do you think you could have did that same thing at a Syracuse, uh, you know, uh, mm. I don't, you know, like some big school, some big PWI or even a smaller PWI. Do you think? you know, you could have had that type of support. And even for what I do now, and I'm in touch with so many different schools, it's so different, even speaking to their staff, right? Like I literally can call, you know, uh, like if I call my son's school for something, he's at North Carolina A&T. When I call A&T and I get the right person, I was just on the phone with on a and I called to ask one question and this me and this lady's on the phone chit chat and she giving me every idea or thing I might need. And you know that she's talking to me like, well, you know what you could also do? Well, this is how it is going on over here. And she's having a conversation with me to not only one, give me the information that I need, but to make me feel comfortable and also make a connection to me. When I work with students and I call a PWI, once in a while I get that person on the phone. But most of the time it's very, you know, by the book. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like this is what you need. This is all it is. And there's no connection there. So I don't believe that I could have had that same experience. And maybe someone has, I don't know, but I don't believe I could have had that same experience where I felt like I had a family at school, right? Like I had a family at home, but when I got to school, I had another family and that made me feel like I could still get things done. And I don't think that comes 
that doesn't come everywhere. That's like an HBCU yeah. culture. Yeah. Wow. So, man, I mean, we got, so now you're back in the fashion shows. You're in um, Beta Alpha Sound. I'm sure they got requirements to, you know, to be a part of that organization. As we know, every every organization on Howard's campus got some type of process, whether it's a pledge process of a day, a week, or whatever, you know. But, you know, you, you do that, and you, you're an accounting major. I mean, that's arguably the toughest major in the school of business. And you're doing all of this while while being a mom. So are you getting internships, you know, when you're working? Like, what are, what are you doing in the – summertime to, to make money and what are you doing to build up your resume so i didn't get any internships while in school <laughs> um yeah i didn't i spent my summers you know i would find something locally to do because one thing that was it was so crazy so being in beta facade we also got you know we were privy to a lot of opportunities before it came onto the campus mm -hmm. right so and the way I did what I what I did do that I was able to build up my resume was using what I was doing for CPD, right? The resumes like they would I was solely so you know when you guys used to send in your resumes to get reviewed, I yeah. was reviewing your resume. Oh really? Yeah. So I saw like everybody's resume. I was making corrections and all of that. Like they let me do all wow. of that. So I was the way I was building my resume was what I was doing on campus during work study. So I worked in CPD for like two years and then I worked in financial aid as well. Mm. that went onto my resume how, um, how did you get connected with those with those jobs now the story for cpd happened because it, it, that was an easy one i got they were like oh you're in the school of business this is what's open for work study i chose cpd now the financial aid story is a good one i had to hustle for financial aid so this is the year this is now when my junior year when i'm bringing my son back on campus I have work study, but they tell me they don't have any open positions. And I was like, what you mean you don't have no open positions? I was like, well, what about, because you have work study, then you also had the other students that didn't have work study that had jobs, and those were all filled. So I needed, I knew I needed a job because I knew that my son was going to eventually, you know, my friends are watching him. I'm looking for a babysitter in the area. I'm going down to, to D.C. Like, I'm in the city applying for welfare, applying for WIC in D.C using my Howard residence. I'm trying to get like low income, uh, you know, babysitting services. Nothing has come through yet, but I was like, I know I need money. I still got to buy diapers and stuff like that. Like my family's helping me, but I, I have to have a job. Do you know, I showed up to that uh, employment office every day for two weeks and sat in there like this. And the lady was like, Candace, we don't have anything. Cause now she knows my name. Cause I kept starting, I, I would go there every day. And I was like, well, I'm gonna come here every day until something opens up because I need a job. And I came for two weeks and then she said, you know what? You could go to financial aid, may have something, but you gotta take a test. And I was like, anybody else out here taking tests to get jobs on campus? Why I gotta take a test? She was like, they need somebody who's proficient in the you know, word and, and all this stuff. I was like, and using stuff I, we, didn't, we weren't even using yet in school, like doing mail mergers and stuff. I said, okay, I'll do it. I had no idea what I was doing. They put me in financial aid, took me to the director's office. I literally taught myself how to do mail merge, whatever, 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 and pass that test, and they gave me a job. Dope. Yo, that's crazy. <laughs> Yo, that's that's dope. I mean, that, that speaks to you, man, your persistence. And, you know, how, like we talked about earlier about being inquisitive and not settling and, and just wanting more. So when you, were at, when you have your son, I mean, how long is he at Howard with you? He was there on campus for my junior year and senior year. Wow, the whole the whole year? Whole two years. How do you do that? That needs to be a book. That that needs to be a whole book. It was the most it, it was it was <laughs> your head, look at your head. Your head it was back. so like it was so <laughs> there was days where I was like, he you know, what about the days when he was crying and I had to study for an exam? What about the days when I finally got a babysitter? And my babysitter was like eight blocks away. And I wasn't trying to wait for the bus and take the bus or whatever, whatever. I would just put him in, you know, they had those big Graco strollers. And if it was raining, I mean, what's good is that when it was raining, shout out to all my friends, 
anybody who had a car on campus, if it was raining, they would call me in the morning and be like, oh, it's raining. How are you getting Jermaine to the babysitter? And they would give me a ride on some of those days. But I'm doing that back and forth every day. Going to campus, take my classes. In between classes, I'm going to work in financial aid while he's there. And then when I get to my room, I'm exhausted. Um, and I would just try to be, I would be staying up at night so frustrated. There was nights when I just cried. Because he was crying. Mm-hmm. And if he didn't feel good. And I was crying because I knew I had to get up and go to class and I had stuff to do and it was frustrating. And I think that's around the time when I, I mean, I always had my faith and I prayed, but I learned how to pray more when I had my son on campus. So when you graduate from Howard, like you made it, right? You did it in four years. Um, you make it out of Howard. What's the plan now? So it was weird coming out of school. Um, because when everybody was, you know, getting job offers and they're taking their job offers now, at one point, I'm like a vice president in, in Beta Alpha Psi. So when a lot of the recruiters were coming to recruit on campus, if you were an account major, they came to us first. And I even got really close with um, a recruiter from KPMG, which was one of the big five at the time. And anytime she came and she was taking out other other students, she would be like, Candace, you want to come? I'm like, yeah, I'll come. You know, I got, we developed a really good relationship and she was offering me a job in DC. And I was like, I can't stay here by myself. Like my friends are going to leave. I don't have any help. I was, I was exhausted. And, and this is, you know, when I work with students, I remember working with a student even even with my niece, I remember the time when she got really tired when she was doing a lot at school and she felt like, I felt like she was making decisions based off her exhaustion. That's what I did. I started making decisions because I was so tired at school of being a mom and being a student and trying to have a life. I wanted to run back home to New York. And uh, the opportunities that were coming to me were in DC. And a lot of um, the other you know, students in Beta Alpha Psi, and a, and a lot of, some of my friends even, they stayed in D.C. and they had those opportunities. So I literally gave up those opportunities because I wanted to go home. And also, I knew that even speaking with people who had took their internships, they were like, oh, we work all day and they have you working at night. All that whining and dining they do when they're trying to get you to sign on, that doesn't happen. And I was like, I just gave up two years, I don't get to really play with my son. I don't get to do things. Like I used to play in the hallway with him and he used to ride his little tricycle in the hallway. I was like, I want to go home and I want to take the summer off. And I literally, when I got home, I went, I didn't take any job offer. I didn't have a plan. I just knew that I was going to eventually look for a job. And I took my son to the museum. We played outside in the dirt. We went to Sesame Place. We went to, you know, I just did normal things with him because I understood that for two years, he didn't get to do certain things because he was at school with me. <clears throat> you mentioned that you, you dealt with depression. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes I feel like that word is used, like, it's thrown around and, and people really don't know what that means. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's just, you know, but obviously in this instance, <laughs> it's enough examples where I'm sure you pretty much knew what you were talking about so what was that like um dealing with depression you know and i remember i remember breaking up with when my girlfriend from howard broke up with me i remember being so sad i feel like every every <laughs> song was like a, a mary j blige song you know what i mean that was that's when i realized like yo, mary j blige is a great artist because <laughs> she's capturing my emotions like perfectly you know right now but how, how was it with, how was it for you dealing with depression and and even when you have the support when you have the the grades when you have the the blessing of your your son when you have all these blessings around you but it's a part of you that it still feels empty you know how was it dealing with that it was tough and i think and looking back i didn't know then that i was depressed It, it didn't come till later that i could look back and see that um, you know, that the feelings that I had and, and the emotions that I was feeling 
were, were depression because like you said, I still, you know, me and his, my son's dad at the time, we were off and on all the time. When I did speak to him, we were arguing a lot. So that was, you know, affecting my emotions. Um, at the end of the day, I had all the, like you said, I had all the support and help at the end of the day, there was a times, like I said, when I'm alone. Right. And I just didn't want to write another paper. I didn't want to get up and walk to the babysitter. Right. Like, I just want to stay in my room. Like, my gosh, I don't want to talk to anybody today. I'm tired. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to show up to work today. I don't want to also, let's not forget, like, my family is still financially not stable. So there was times when I'm working and even with my money, I couldn't really call home all the time and get help. So there's times when I had to go without for things. So it was like, you know, it's those moments where nobody, well, I couldn't, I could tell some people some things, but I couldn't tell you everything. Right. And then when I went home, I love being home. My family was awesome. And it was, I was, it was good to go home and be with all of them. But then even knowing that they were still having some struggles. Right. And it would feel awkward to be like, okay, well, let me go back to my other life. You know what I mean? And leave everyone behind. So you, and, and again, I told you I had this thing where I had this, I felt like I had to weight on my shoulders. So even to make sure that I graduated in four years was, was pressure. And I remember speaking to one of my accounting professors, he was like, Candace, you know, and we were, we were really close. And he said, you don't have to graduate in four years. And I was like, I don't have the money to stay here next year. Hmm. And he, he really wanted me to like, stop taking on so many classes. He was like, Candace, you can relax. You have a child, take your time. And I said, you're saying that that sounds good, but who's going to pay for it? I can barely stay here for the four years. I mean, look, looking back, do you think that was sound advice? Oh, absolutely. I think yeah. he was, he, I think that was, when I look back, there was so many things I, I look back now. And, and again, that's why I do what I do now as an academic coach, because I talk to students because I want you to talk. I want to speak to them and get them to make a wise decision and understand that some of their emotions and their feelings are temporary, right? And you don't see the long term. I, I, I received a lot of good advice sometimes. Like, looking back, maybe I, I should have stayed in D.C. and took, taken one of those positions, right? And maybe figure out how to maybe get my mom to move with me or something, you know what I mean? Or maybe I should have t stayed and did, there was an MBA program in a business school. It was only an extra year and a half. Knowing mm -hmm. what I know now, there was some money I could have received to get that done. Right. But I was at my end, you know, your wits end. And I was yeah. no longer trying to hustle. I really was like, Oh, I made it to the end. Let me get home. But even working in financial aid, I did find out a lot of information while I was working there that did help me. And I received more scholarship money and things like that. But I think his advice was wise because I, I advise students too, like, instead of loading yourself up, this is not high school. You don't have to leave in four years. It's college. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think a lot of college students try to they are, you know, creating something to, you know, for what they see or what they hear. Like, oh, you're here for your bachelor's, your bachelor's four years. Hurry up and get out, get in and get out. Right. But no, maybe I should take the semester. If I'm taking these challenging courses, maybe I should only take four classes and not seven. Like mm -hmm. there was one time I was trying to load myself up just to make sure I was going to leave in four years. So that advice that he gave me is actually wisdom, even though I didn't follow it. Mm. Damn. Damn. So tell me about some of the work you're doing right now. I mean, uh, you got your own business, right? Um, mm -hmm. Is it uh, be, be Encouraged LLC? Be Encouraged, so you, yes, <clears throat> yes. So tell me about that work. So I have my own company. It is called Be Encouraged LLC. And I am, I do coaching and mentoring. And um, part of that, because I also do uh, coach women. And, and do like speaking events. I do a lot of speaking events and I tell this story a lot and um, also some other parts of my life. But I am an academic success coach and college planning consultant. And this business was literally built off my college experience. Wow. Right? Yeah, I felt like the one thing I was missing was someone to constantly be there to give me that sound advice and wisdom. And I even talk about it on social media, like on my page, 
I, I did a video of a conversation with my dad and I'm actually going to interview my dad so I can have this because people always ask me about it because I'm always telling them something that he told me. And one of the things my dad said to me, and this is just recently um, this month, he said, me and your mom knew we didn't have what you need, what you needed. Like we didn't have the education. We didn't have that, that path to show you how to have a successful collegiate journey. He said, we didn't have that. All we could do was encourage you. And he said, throughout your life, Candace, he said, you would come with ideas all the time, right? He said, you didn't say, mommy, I want to do a lemonade stand. He said, you came with the flyer and said, here's the, the information for my lemonade stand. I need you to go make copies so I can put them in everyone's mailbox, right? Mm -hmm. And he said, anything you did, we wanted to encourage you, even though half of what you did, we didn't know what you were doing. We knew that you were ambitious. And when you wanted to go to school, my dad always tells a story. My father tried to talk me out of Howard. And I thought he was insane. I'm like, we've been on the same page since sixth grade. The minute I get accepted at Howard, you're trying to talk me out of it to go to another school. But again, he was using wisdom because the other schools were giving me more money. Howard didn't, didn't give me any money coming in. All I got was like, you know, my, my Pell Grants and some loans. I didn't get a scholarship into Howard coming in, but there was like, Temple was giving me money and another school was giving me money. And my dad was really, you know, going back and forth on me, back and forth with me. And he said that he had to pray about it. And God told him, if you don't let her make this decision, if she chooses another school, she's not going to finish. Wow. And he said, that's when he left it alone. Cause he said, I didn't want to be the reason you failed or I didn't want to be the reason or your hindrance to you. So even if you chose Howard, God said you were going to finish Howard. And he said, even when you started going through, we were going through all those things. I knew that you were going to finish because he said, had you chosen any other school, it wasn't for you. And, and that's when I knew like this was her dream. It was not only her dream. It was a desire that God gave me. And a lot of what I was going through, he said, we didn't know then, but it became the very reason why you built your business. It became your testimony, Candace. He said, it's the thing that gives people life when they hear your story and see that you endured and, mm. and you came back out. And he said, we didn't have anything else to give you but encouragement. And that's how Be Encouraged came. Wow. That's an amazing story, man. Shout out to, shout out to folks with wisdom. So, I mean, how is it being an entrepreneur? You know, tell me about some, some success stories that you've had. Being an entrepreneur is hard because, <laughs> like... Yeah, you just you like know, the challenge because you got three you got three boys, you married, and yeah, you're an entrepreneur. Two boys and a girl. Two boys Two and boys, a girl. okay. My bad. Two boys and a girl. Yeah. And they're, you know, spaced out because my oldest son, you know, uh, my youngest two are my, you know, my children with my husband. So I have a 19. My son actually just turned, my middle son turned 14 yesterday. And, okay. um, happy belated. Thank you. And my daughter is eight. So they're really spaced out. And, um, it's been interesting. And I think for me, my first success story is actually my niece. Um, besides I was always, there were like kids from church that would come to me that, and I helped them. But my niece became my first success story, my oldest niece that I was very close to. So her and my son grew up like brother and sister, mm -hmm. right? And she saw everything. So uh, the way I mimicked my sister is the way she mimicked me. And she followed everything I did. So she got to come to Howard's campus. She got to spend a night with me when my parents were in town and stay in the dorms, right? So she had her taste of college campus of a college campus, but when she was in school, she did really well up until junior high school when my sister passed away, my middle sister. And, you know, she was a victim of a crime, she was murdered. And that actually, you know, that kind of sent my niece on a whole different path because she went through depression as well. The whole family were now, you know, we lost my sister, she was only 30 years old. And that's actually when I really knew I was in depression. And that's why I have to look back in school and see that I had it then. But I didn't really experience the depression um, consciously until I lost my sister. So working with my niece to get her back on track through high school to college was tough. And when she got into college, she went to, she graduated from Lincoln University, the first HBCU. But when she got there, she was like in a bridge program where they let her take community classes at the local community college or stay on campus to get her grades up 
And the first two years she struggled and she wanted to quit so bad. And I literally just worked with her and created strategies with her and showed her what to do. And um, I'm not a tutor, but I told her like, this is how you work with this professor. This is how you do this. These are the classes, make sure you're taking this. And when she would speak to her advisor, she went over her stuff with me. And my niece wind up doing a 180 degree turn in school. She wound up pledging, she's a AKA. She made the Dean's List twice. She became a resident assistant. She's now giving campus tours. And I mean, for the first two years, she was like, I can't do this. And she's like my first success story. And when I'm doing certain things with students, I always have her come on to encourage them because she's like, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Hmm. You know, so, and after working with her, and then it just became a thing that I started working with more and more students. And then people also started to notice how well my kids were doing, like my oldest son, how well he was doing in school so young. And it was another educator who said something to me. And she said, um, what do you do with him at home? <laughs> and she said, because he's, he's not a norm, like he's not like the rest of the other students. She was like, he knows how to do things that the other students didn't know how to do. And this is someone that was at his after school program. And she's like, could you come and talk to the other moms? And kind of share what you do with him. She said, because when he comes in, he's very studious. He knows how to, it was like simple things like, oh, when we go to the library, he knows how to search the encyclopedias and use the dictionaries. And he knows how to do this. And I was like, well, yeah, he has a, a regiment at home. We have a, and I do it for all my kids now. And now people say that about my daughter because she's exposed to what her brothers do. In second grade, they put her in gifted and talented because it's like, she's, she's a, you know, she's doing more. So it was like, the success story, my first one was like with my niece and then it just carried over and I was doing this so much. It's not till a mentor told me, this is what you should be doing. And I kept toying with it back and forth. And like, I didn't really want to be, you know, I was kind of doing it low key because being an entrepreneur is a lot. I'm married, I have kids, you know, I lost my sister and then I lost my mom. I was going through life and then trying to run a business and trying to help people it became overwhelming and I would keep like doing it just enough that I felt like I was satisfying the desire, but not enough to go to commit. And then like in 2014, I was looking up scholarships for my, my, my niece and I got in, I um, it came in contact with a young black woman. I, her name uh, leaves me now, but she had went to school like debt free she did an interview with someone who was an academic coach. And it was the very first time I had language and saw somebody doing something that seemed similar to what I was doing. And that woman that she was interviewing, Gretchen Wagner, wound up becoming my mentor. And I've been working with her to this day. And that's how I went like full-fledged wow. entrepreneur. Wow. If you can, you know, just touch on the importance of, of having a mentor. <sighs> I think having a mentor is so vital for, for students. And I stress it to a lot of my students and the way I get them to do that, I, I, I always talk to them about having relationships with the professors and with um, like staff on campus. I have a niece who's actually at Howard and she, she met Ms. Hampton. And she was like, Miss Hampton remembers you. I told her that you're my auntie, right? And it's funny, um, she's she had Uve as one of her professors. Crazy. Crazy, Crazy. right? I think she had Uve, Uve. Is like the she's like the department chair now. Yeah, Uve like messaged me, was like, I met your niece. And I was like, oh my gosh. But one of the things I stressed to her that she did is learn how to create uh, relationships because I feel like even when you get to school, if you didn't have a mentor before you got to college, you can literally, you know, you don't know who your professors are. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I learned that on campus too, right? Like who knew Dr. Gray would be as amazing as he was, right? What if I had just ignored that whole situation? It was like, I'm gonna just come to work every day, stay to myself and, and go home. But I would engage in conversation with them and, and felt when they made their advances to welcome me, I, I received it. And I think students need to learn that too. Like take up the opportunity to know who's on campus, who your professors are, because they may turn out to be your mentor. And if you see someone that you are intrigued with, maybe you can ask them to be a mentor, right? You mm -hmm. start coming in, you start asking them questions, you hang around a little bit. Because 
like I said, the professor gave me wise counsel, right? Like, don't try to rush out in four years. I well, didn't follow you, it, but well, he how gave do you it to as me. A, but how do you, how do you get someone this, you know, here a professor, they're coming in with this wisdom. They've lived 20 years longer than you have or 30 or 40 years longer. How do you, I mean, I guess the challenge would be how do you get them to buy in to, to what you're saying? Like you, you told your niece, don't give up. Don't give up. Keep going. But in that moment, you're like, I can't do this no more. This is too much for me. You know, how do you get somebody to, to buy in to, to what you're saying? And that, that's actually hard because even with her, you know, she didn't listen for a long time. Right. She had the it worked for her because not only was I her mentor, I was her aunt. Right. So I could stick with her. So the challenge for students, like you said, to getting someone to buy in, what I tell them is make yourself available. Mm -hmm. Right. So I might go into the professor and talk to them sometimes. I said, make up, make up reasons to go see your professor, period. Like that's actually something I just tell them to do. Like you should have a relationship with your professor regardless. Yeah. But if you notice it's someone that you would like to mentor, you make yourself available to them. Go in and ask them, like, oh, you know. Is there a way for me to work in the office and be an assistant? Is there a way, if you notice that they're working like Dr. Gray, you knew that he's doing Center for Professional Development. Is there a way that I can help you um, conduct the golf etiquette classes? Right? Can I assist you? Can I hand out some papers? Like make mm. yourself available to them so they can start to see the kind of person that you are. Right? Because then eventually now you're drawing them into you instead of you trying to, you know, press too hard on them, right? Kind of find a way to draw them in. Now that might take some time for some people, some people that some professors or, <clears> or, or people might open up right away. Some, some may not, but you still have to try. No, I think that's good advice. Cause I tell my staff, you know, when we're trying to network with like realtors and stuff, I always say like, you always want to leave with, how can I help you first before you go in and just start asking for stuff. So I think that that's, Really great advice. Tell me about, you know, your husband and your three kids now that things have kind of come full circle. You know, when you when I read your bio from start to finish, it's like a <laughs> dramatic <laughs> difference. You know what I mean? Dramatic difference from, yeah. you know, the house burning down. Uh, pregnant, your sister, your sister's death, your mom, mm -hmm. then it ends with businesswoman, boss, you know what I mean, uh, married, three kids, like it's a, it's a, it's a great story and it's still being written, you know, tell me, yeah. tell, tell me about that, even when I see, you know, I, I was looking at your Instagram, I see your son playing soccer, on his mm. birthday, I'm like, I'm like, she a soccer mom too, you know what I mean? Like, you know what, what is, you know, talk about that for a little bit, cause, you know, we hear all these stories about, oh, it's so hard on black women to find black men, and you know, I couldn't date nobody that, that got kids, and you know, and blah blah blah. You know, you just hear all of these distractions in in our community, but. You know, when I look at you, you know, I see a person that, that persevered and, and really didn't get caught up listening to, to noise, you know. Um, talk about your family, you know, briefly, like your the, the inner circle. Yeah, so, I mean, when I met my husband, it was tough, uh, you know. <laughs> Shout out to him. Every, because he had, everything he had, tough. He had, <laughs> I was tough because I was not trusting nobody. And he, he could laugh about it. Like, I would be like, uh, when he was, you know, expressing that he liked me, stuff like that, we're dating. I was like, you know, you're cool, but it's okay if we don't, you know, we don't need to be serious or anything like that. Like, I was always on the defensive because of my son's father. He was out here doing whatever, right? So I was like, I'm not doing that again. I'm just going to let you know I'm chilling. I don't need nothing serious. And he just kept advancing, like, I'm okay with your son and stuff like that. I'm like, but if you need to go, it's okay. You could go. We, we, you know, we could just be cool. So he, he, he pressed in a little bit. Um, I was a little difficult in the beginning because I didn't want to trust anybody. I, I felt like I wanted a relationship, but I, I didn't want one because I didn't want to wind up in the same situation. But um, 
with us, he was really good with my son. And, you know, that meant, meant a lot to me. So he's, he came into my life when my son was four years old. So he's really raised my, my oldest son, who's 19 now. And although he, you know, my son knows who his father is, he sees him, you know, as his father. And they have a really, really great relationship. And, um, you know, we had a lot of bumps in the road in the beginning because I was young, we were young and, you know, I, I had a kid and that's something new, right? He meets a woman who already has a child. He has to now learn how to not even just be with me. He has to learn the son, right? And once we had our son, when I was like 25, I was scared then too. And I would tell him like, when I found out I was pregnant, I, I was, I, you know, I kind of looked at the stick in shock like and and he was elated he was like oh my goodness and I'm, I'm in shock all over again like i'm 19 scared um and he you know had to keep reassuring me that so i'm wait, not the, going to do this so the, the second time were, were you married at this time no we weren't married yet so man so, so you so, probably so, you probably having like ptsd or are you like damn <laughs> you know I, I did. That's a, I, I literally was in like, not again. <laughs> right? like, I did it again. <laughs> and I, I, I was, I was like, I was being careful, right? Like how this time I was smarter, but it, you know, we, we had our son and two, within two years, we, we did get married. And, um, my daughter was actually planned. We planned to have her <laughs> once we waited, we planned to have her, but it's been really good that um, my husband is a personal trainer. So when you see my son in soccer, stuff like that, uh, my kids are, are blessed and, and we, we remind them pretty often, like you have the best of both worlds because my husband was able to coach my oldest son when he was in soccer. He mm -hmm. play, he ran track in high school and then he was able to coach our middle son up until now where our middle son plays for a club now and he no longer coaches him. But he was he had that ability to coach them. And not only that, he became their personal trainer. So um, one of the best things I think I love about what we, what we are able to do with them is that academically I'm on them. But their dad is the one who works with them athletically. So my middle son, we were able to see a transformation with him for when he played for his dad. And now that his dad now gets to be on the sideline to be a dad. He also trains him. So I'm literally seeing my 14 year old like get muscle and I can see from, he wakes up at 6.30, 6 a.m., wakes up his dad and it's like, okay, we got to get outside because they're on the field at 7 a.m. Wow. Doing drills, doing workouts. And it literally, we, we are seeing him become a better player because of it, mm. right? So he has a program that he's, you know, doing with him that he can now do with other um, athletes, student athletes. So our house is crazy sometimes because think about when my, when, when my son was in, the oldest one was here when he wasn't in school, I mean, in college, he's running track. My middle son was playing for two soccer teams and my daughter swims and they are all, they were all on honor roll. So what, what advice do you have for the, the 18 year old Candace coming into Howard right now? What advice do you have? Or 18-year-old Carl <laughs> coming into Howard right now, you know, bright-eyed, you know, wants to get the best out of it, happy to get away from the family, happy to get some independence. You know, what advice do you have for that person? Um, even if I could say to my 18-year-old self, I would say, Candace, you're enough. You're enough. Because then, like I said, I had that, I was dealing with that whole thing. And one of the things I do while I work with students is, um, which is not traditional, even though I work with them academically, a lot of what I do is not focused on their academics. It's fo focused on their character, their habits, and their skills. And because I know I dealt with that identity issue, if I, I just wanted, I always want them to know, like, as you are, you're enough, right? Because you're going to get around other people on campus. You're going to feel like you have to live up to something or you had to live up to something at home, or you were the, that, the football athlete, you know what I mean? In high school, then you get to college and you're not, you're not so hot no more, right? And you're looking at everyone else around you. I just wanna let you know, like you're enough and you're enough as you are. 
And I want you to be okay with who you are because that is the person that we want to see show up in the classroom. That is the person we want to see show up with your friends. And that's the person we want to see show up for any organization, right? Because your most authentic you is that person is that is that's going to soar in the classroom because you show up just as yourself and saying, I'm enough just as I am. Welcome to the Go Fish Village podcast. As a Chinese proverb says, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. At Go Fish, our goal is to teach individuals just like you how to build wealth through real estate. Current projects. I know you got candid conversations with Candy. What, mm. What's that? So my podcast. So I actually like just rebranded my podcast. It was first, it was called like The Strong One. I started it, but like last year, but I wasn't consistent. Like my schedule was so hectic. I was like randomly recording and now I rebranded it and I've already recorded some episodes so I can release them. But yes, candid conversations. I changed it around because I want to be able to talk about academics. I also want to talk about life stuff. You know what I mean? Um, even when I speak a lot to the moms, mm -hmm. just like I, I I'm doing now with you, because I know what that feels like to feel like, especially if they are, you know, I went through a season when I was a single parent, you know, I had the help. So I actually don't even love that term, like being single parent, because I always had support and I always had help. But I understand that there's a time when you're by yourself. And mm -hmm. if you have multiple children and you're trying to run your home and you want to be involved in your school and you want to, you know, be there for them. So I like to talk to the moms. And I feel like the candid conversations is how I can speak to students. I can speak to moms. I can even speak to, you know, families you know, based off my family experience. And I love having the different conversations that maybe someone doesn't want to say, like they don't want to, you know, in black culture, people don't want to talk about therapy. I have a therapist. I had, I found therapy after my mother passed away when I noticed that I was depressed hmm. and I finally decided to do something about it. Right. Wow. And it, it was great for me. And then I noticed when I became an entrepreneur, I still needed the therapy because therapy, you know, um, there's a, a, a minister, a, a woman I love, Dr. Anita Phillips, and she goes, prayer is a weapon and therapy is a strategy. And I love that because prayer is your weapon. But I know even for a lot of, of Christians, like they think one, they, you can't pray everything away. You need to actually do something sometimes. And therapy is a strategy. So I like to talk about topics like that and, and also with kids and stuff. So I love candid conversations because I can talk about all those things, you know, and have all those different conversations. Wow. Yeah, therapy is, you know, I, we did premarital counseling, you know, me and my wife, that was the closest thing that we did. But the more, the more and more I talk to people, especially, you know, one, one of the things that it, it, in my life, you know, you, it's like you pray to get to a point, you, you work hard to get to this point in life, and then you kind of finally get there. And then the stress of maintaining um, mm -hmm. certain things, expect, you know, as an entrepreneur, you know, I've been in business eight years and, you know, these last two months was, was tough for us, like really, really tough. But, you know, these last week has been great, you know, but juggling that with family and bills and just maintaining the brand that you've built, you know, is is, is very hard. So, you know, mm -hmm. shout out to you because, you know, we, we don't really hear black people talk about therapists. You hear it more and more, but you're kind of mm -hmm. hearing it more on a higher level with people that, that have means or, or something like that. Um, what about your legacy? You know, when it's all said and done, what do you want your legacy to be? Mm. I really wanted to, you know, in what I do with students and families, I want them to be confident. And I always, I, I was speaking to a parent, I had like a call, like a, a wrap up call um, for the time period that I was work, working with a student and a parent. And I asked them, how do you feel now after working with me? And the mom, the first thing she said, she was like, I feel more confident. And I think that was the problem is that not only did I not know what to do for her son, you know, college wise, I didn't know where to start, but I felt confident. And in my legacy, I want families to feel like this is not, college is not this thing that you can only do because you have money. College is not this thing where you go and you just go get a job, 
right? I always teach people that college should be an experience. It should be an opportunity. It should be mm-hmm. one of the paths you take to open up into your purpose. So when I, you know, in my legacy, I want, I wanted to keep multiplying. I want to work with a family and I want you to go and do the same thing I did with you and, and let the encouragement just keep rolling over and rolling mm-hmm. over and rolling over to every family that they begin to feel so confident and who they are and what they can do that they won't sit. And this is what I've seen. I've seen the most promising students and kids miss out on opportunities just because no one encouraged them. I had a mom say to me, she said, I gave my children material things and love, but I never encouraged them to do anything. And yeah, right. So my legacy, I do want it to be encouragement. And I want families to have the confidence. I want students to always be confident of who they are. And no matter what life is throwing at you, right? Because I want you to look at my life. And it could have took me out several times. Hmm. The fire, my son, my sister, right? Like I had the, life could have literally taken me out, but I had to come to understand that I was chosen to endure those things, to be able to encourage someone else to get past that point. So in my legacy, I want you to be encouraged that no matter what life is giving to you, that you can make it through. You can move it and you can do it with confidence and assurance that although this may feel like a hard thing to do, I know that I'm going to make it to the other side. Mm. It's only temporary, you know, only temporary, man, that's real. Professional encourager, mm-hmm. Candace Hudson. You've been a great guest. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. So we always close out with a little bit of Jeopardy or trivia of Howard. So we can see Uh-oh. what you know about, about Howard. You know, some easy questions. I'm sure you'll get this right. And then we have a little rapid fire. So, so first, uh, we'll start with the trivia. Uh, what year was Howard founded? 1867. Okay. What is the Howard motto? Uh, uh, is it like leadership, trust, and service, something like that? You clo- Hey, tr- truth and service, you close. Truth and service. <laughs> yeah. What is the body of water located closest to Howard? Um, the Potomac River. <laughs> the, the reservoir. <laughs> The reservoir? Oh, I don't remember. The reservoir. Oh, how many God. halls? How many halls are in the quad? I was saying ten, four, five. Ah. <laughs> um. I was close. Spell Crampton. Huh? Spell Crampton. How do you spell Crampton? Oh, C R A M T O N. Oh, you got it right. A lot of people throw a P, P in there. I walked in Crampton too many times not to know. Okay, okay. Finish this sentence. Reared against the eastern sky. Oh, gosh. I don't remember, but I know. But I don't remember. Proudly there on Hilltop High. Um, What's the Black National Anthem? I do know the Black National Anthem, but you just put me on the spot and I went blank. So please don't do that. <laughs> Lift every voice and voice sing. Voice and sing. <laughs> <laughs> that is terrible. That's terrible. I went blank. That is terrible. Um, who was the president of Howard? Uh, now, uh, Wayne, uh, Mr. Frederick. Mr. There you go. Yeah. Dr. Frederick. Dr. Frederick, yes. How many schools and colleges does Howard have? Oh, gosh, I don't, I don't remember. How many is it? <laughs> 13. Ah, oh, 13. 13. I was like, let's say like 15. What is the zip code of Howard? Two, two zero three. Oh, my gosh. Mm-mm. I don't remember. 20059. Oh, yeah, I went and got the 59. I knew the 200. All right, next we're going to do rapid fire. So you just got to give an answer. All right. So whatever comes to mind, 
after I say the question or phrase. So the first one is who you know or what you know? Who you know? U Street or Adams Morgan? U Street. Is homecoming better as a student or as an alum? See, that's funny for me because I had a kid. So <laughs> as an alum, because I don't have no worry about no babysitter. <laughs> Your best Howard moment. Homecoming fashion show. Okay. Um, when did you find your voice? Mm. I think I found my voice um, really after my sister passed. When did you realize you were the shit? I kind of always knew. I knew I was dope. Biggest Howard regret? That I didn't involve myself in more um, at activities. I didn't take advantage of, we had a lot of stuff, like looking back, we have a lot of opportunities there and I didn't take advantage of all of them. Hmm. Um, next question. You got to start one, bench one, or cut one. You got dream, you got park, you got 2K9. Uh, well, we could cut park. We could cut part. And you said, wait, bench one, cut one. And start one. We're going to cut part. We're going to bitch dream. And we're going to start with 2K9. That's 2K. That's my, my best. 2K9. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I loved it. So you got start one, bench one, cut one, freshman orientation, homecoming, graduation. Okay, so I'm gonna cut graduation. Our and graduation like, was was horrible. Our graduation, yeah, was horrible. I, yeah, we it rained out like it was it was horrible. So we could cut graduation, and I'm going to bench homecoming and start with freshman orientation because freshman orientation is how I met all my friends. Yeah, same with me. Freshman orientation was the bomb. Graduation though. Remember, it rained so hard, and a lot of parents couldn't see their kids graduate. But uh, Esco actually snuck my dad in the gym to to wow. help him see the school of business. That's crazy. That's crazy. My dad was like, "Some guy named Esco." <laughs> <laughs> How did he and make himself known then, to it? Right, right. Then Esco came up to me like, "Yo, I, I, this dude was looking for you." I was like, "Only, only you, man. On, only Esco oh, could man. do something like that." Um. What's the worst advice you ever got? Let's see. I don't want to be petty, you know, bring up my son's father or something. But the worst advice I got was him telling me to go to Hampton and not Howard. Yeah. Yeah. Don't do that. Start <laughs> one. Start one. Bench one. Cut one. Ho Chi, Cluck You, China Wonder. Okay, we could cut Ho Chi because I ate <laughs> yeah. more of the other two anyway. Um, oh, that's, we could bench Cluck You and I'm going to start with China Wonder. Got you. Candace Hudson, you've been a great guest. If, so if somebody wants to contact you, you know, they, they need to book you to be this motivational speaker. How do they get in touch with you or, you know, your company if they want to, you know, take advantage of your services? Well, you can contact me at, at Candice, C-A-N-D-A-C-E at CandiceHudson.com. Um, I do have my website up. It is www.CandiceHudson.com. It is under renovation. We just took the old one down and put up a new one, but you can still um, be able to contact me through there. And if you follow, follow me on IG um, at Candace M. Hudson, and that's Hudson with a T, not a D. Dope. 
Dope, man. Thank you again for coming on the show. I truly appreciate you taking time out today. Thank you so much for having me. I had so much fun. Thank you for joining the HU Movemaker Podcast, where we highlight folks that have contributed to the Howard legacy at the highest levels. To hear more interviews or purchase merchandise, please visit www.humovemakers.com.